to a friend, put it on your refrigerator, write it on your calendar, don't forget about it. You can hear more in just one minute about that. Also, just to remind you, Karen Vandervoort can get cards at uh, Brookdale Westlake Village. She will receive those cards. And that we are immediately following worship today. We have a special meeting of the congregation for the purpose of electing ruling elders. And on the back of your bulletin, you see the notation that we will have Ash Wednesday service right here. This Wednesday, February the 26th. I couldn't remember what the day was. This Wednesday, February 26th, right here. We will celebrate the beginning of Lent with Ash Wednesday. So, John and Karen have a word for us this morning about Bag the Beans. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. How do you feel today? Your response is, we feel good. Oh, we feel so good. Yeah. So one more time. How do you feel today? We feel good. Oh, we feel so good. Feel so good. Yeah. Yes. Actually, we're feeling a wee bit nervous about our eighth consecutive year working with the Kids Care Outreach Program, packaging meals for the second Harvest Food Bank. Two weeks from today, on March 8th, we will leave worship and head to the gym to pack 20,000 beans and rice meals to help feed the hungry in Erie County. We sure are nervous about these delicious and nutritious meals, which are full of dried carrots, onions, tomatoes, celery, cabbage, bell peppers, along with added vitamins and nutrients. How many of you have packed in past years? So we sure aren't nervous about our professional packers either. So here's our challenge. We need lots of help with 10 assembly line tables and bunch of runners to handle the supplies. We need at least 120 people to make this happen. This is an outstanding opportunity to invite your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers to join us. So what do we do when we are nervous about anything? That's, That's right. right. We, we pray. pray. We know that God is in control and he will provide the hands to get the job done. What else do we do when we are feeling apprehensive and unsure? That's right. It is time for another Minute for Mission song. If this goes well, it will be the second song on the album right after Jack and Diane. Ready, John? Ready, Karen. Here we go. Beans and rice, the magical fruits. Kids care packaging is part of our roots. The more we pack, the better we feel. So come to the gym to pack a meal. We need you all to get this job done. So the victory over hunger can be won. Tis no time, dear pastor, to drag out your talk. Perhaps your wife Brady will bring a mouth sock. <laughs> Our shirts say, being the hands of Christ, join us March 8th to pack some beans and rice. Actually, we're really not nervous. We're excited. Woohoo! Nervous can create some negative brain chemistry while being excited produces positive energy and motivation. And most importantly, we know that God is with us. So please see us after worship to sign up and wear yellow on March 8th. Hey, hey Church, Church of the, of the Cross, Cross, how do you feel today? We feel good. Oh, we feel so good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brady's already just said, as I was getting up there, she said she is going to be bringing a mouth sock. Uh, she's going to be testing some over the next few weeks to find the most efficient one. But let's get up and greet one another this morning in the love of God.
I like the tie, Zach. Do you know what that pattern is called? That is called a paisley. Very famous, very famous in ties. I'm a tie guy, so I like it. A paisley tie. You guys get on that, get a paisley tie. And it's timeless tie, right? Are you, answer this question, yes or no, are you priests? Yes or no? Mm. Dawson, are you a priest? No? Gracie, are you a priest? No. No? Ben? No? no? Eliana, are you a priest? Yes, you are. That is right. Zach, are you a priest? Yes, you are. Follow your sister. She's smart. Women are always smarter than you. Learn that now. Yes, you are priests. Now, you're not wearing a black shirt and a white collar, right? You think of a priest, right? We think of somebody wearing a black shirt and a white collar, right? Well, that's a kind of a priest. That's a, a Catholic priest or an Episcopal priest, right? But you are priests. God says you're priests. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, God said about all the people, it said, you will be my kingdom of priests. Amen. So you are all priests. So what do priests do? Does anybody know what a priest does? I heard Ronnie back there speak some Latin I like that. <laughs> Anybody know what a priest, what does a priest do? What do you think? Where does a priest work? Let's ask it that way. Where does the priest work? Church. Church? Okay. Absolutely. And what, what do the priests do in the church? They talk. They talk. <laughs> a lot. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes too much. Priests talk, and they talk in certain ways. What kind of special ways do priests talk? Zach, what do you think? How do priests talk? Do they use a special kind of, of words? Gracie? Yes. Yes, they do? What if they didn't? You can all be priests, okay? Because priests do talk, right? That what do they talk about? They talk about God, right? But they don't use any special words. Priests say things like, God loves you. Do you think you could say that? Yeah. All right, try it. God loves you. Is that true? Yes. I hope so. Or else we're all up a creek, right? Yeah. <laughs> priests say words like that. God loves you. So you can be priests. Priests also pray. So when you feel something on your heart, you really feel like you need to have a conversation with God, you can do that. You don't have to go to anybody else. You don't have to pick up a special phone. You can just do it yourself because you're priests. Priests also, what else do priests do? Anything else you can think of? Do they do anything else that's special? Yeah, somebody just said it. They sing. Sometimes priests sing. Can you sing? I mean, this is not a question of whether or not you're tonal and, you know, like a good singer. But can you sing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can. <laughs> I can't sing, but we can. Can you sing, Jesus loves me? Yeah. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him below, they are weak, but he is strong. So you have two things that you can do as priests. You can tell people God loves you, and you can sing them a song. Jesus loves you. You can be priests. We are all priests because God said we are priests that serve our God and speak God's words and sing God's songs. So, when you leave this time right now, I want you to walk as priests walk. How do priests walk? However they feel like, right? There's no right or wrong answer to that. Because you are priests. However you walk, however you sing, however you talk, that's how God has made you to sing and talk and walk and be, because you are a priest to our God. So let's give a word of thanks and prayer as we pray this morning. Loving God, we are so thankful that you have called us to be your kingdom of priests. You have set us apart, and you have given us a special task to speak your words, to sing your songs, to go far and wide, and to share your love in all that we say and all that we do. We thank you this day that you called us and set us apart as priests of your kingdom to do your holy work. These things we give thanks to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
we wind down this week with our four-week series on our, our vision for 2020. We hear this morning, we focus on gospel, good news. So we hear first from Exodus 19. On the third new moon after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore... If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. We hear secondly this morning from the gospel according to Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly uh, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the voice, from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Friends, would you pray with me for just one moment? Lord, speak to these people whom you love through your most imperfect vessel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week I referred to the little catchphrase, who and whose we are. That little phrase is central to defining our identity. Who am I and to whom do I belong? We have many ways to define ourselves. For example, I might say, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a pastor, I'm a firefighter, I'm a man. These may be ways for me to define my identity. We then take the next step to define to whom we belong. Again, I might say, I belong to Brady as her husband. I belong to all of you as your pastor. I belong to my parents as their son. I belong to Lake Erie Presbytery as a minister member. Again, these may be just some of the ways that I use to define to whom I belong. Now, each of us will have our own different ways of defining ourselves. But the chief identity that we have is set for us by God. We hear from the very opening sentences of Scripture that each of us is constructed in the image and the likeness of our God. That's an important part of who we are because it refutes our ability to believe all the lies that we tell about ourselves, about our lack of beauty or our lack of intelligence or our lack of abilities. It also helps us to stave off the tendency to believe all the junk the world wants to say about us. We then hear just a little bit later in the Hebrew Bible that we are a beloved people who were rescued by a loving God. And today we heard three important descriptors that set our identity and also define to whom we belong. We are told that we are a treasured possession of our God. That we are priests and that we are a holy people. These will become the most important definitions that will ever be granted for us. 
While we certainly may use other words to explain ourselves, these three things become the most important way for us to speak about ourselves and for how the world can know us. These three descriptors are what make us who we are. They are the essence of our being. They grant us the joy of total freedom with our God. They are words that confirm that we have been freed from every other oppressive force, and they are words which grant us a place to always be found. In the original context of these words from Exodus, the people of Israel had been known to their captors for generations in Egypt as simply slaves. Their king, Pharaoh, did not treat them well. They were oppressed with hard labor and a life of serving his interests. They had to build huge cities. They had to take part in his wars. They had to serve him in whatever way he chose. And in return, they received nothing more than a hard life of bitter physical labor. But after the God of Israel rescues this people from their imprisonment, God grants them a new life. A life which is actually full of life and not certain death. A life which is full of possibility and freedom. And while it's true that God does ask a little of them for their freedom, the blessings that they will receive always far outweigh any demands that is work, the work of demand that is given to them. God tells this now formerly slave people that they will no longer be forced laborers for anyone. Instead, God grants to them a humongous promotion. They are now priests. Every single last one of them. To hold the office of priest meant to live your life at the intersection of the sacred and the common. The priest in ancient Israel, or frankly any ancient civilization, was meant to be a hinge point where the divine could meet the people and the people could meet the divine. And so instead of a, a holy special class, God is declaring that all of God's people will be priests for God. They will hold a sacred role for God. Their entire lives will be spent in constant worship and adoration of God. They as individuals and as an entire people will draw the whole world to God in their sacred ministrations. This is a deep identity. This is a paradigm shifting identity. Instead of being an object of sweat and blood for the benefit of just one earthly ruler, this people will now be the object of their God's desire. They are being specially sought after by this God who has made them a holy people. They are, as God declares them, a treasured possession. God is their king now. No more earthly rulers or autocrats. No more politicians bent on destroying them and using them for only what they can build. They will no longer make the name and the power of some dastardly ruler great. Instead, they will make the name of their God great. And in return, God is granting to them life in abundance. This will be a whole new way of life for this people. They had become very accustomed to only being defined by derogatory names that they were called as they were being whipped and cajoled into yet another imperial building project. They are finding out that the kingdom which they will serve is not run for earthly greed and for the desires of human greatness. Instead, the kingdom for which they work is God's kingdom. The entire creation. God tells them directly, look, everything that you know and everything that you see is mine. I own all of it. I'm in charge of it. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to give you some part of it. God grants to the people the opportunity to share in the governing duties of the cosmos. God gives to the people a place within this massive kingdom and simply asks the people to work alongside God in making the entire place holy again. Because honestly, that's what God's desire always was for the whole creation in the first place. When God created the world, God called it good. The entire creation was meant to be a temple, a home, a holy abode where God could live with that which God created. 
But then the place fell on hard times. The humans messed up. They disobeyed the voice of their creator. They sought to do and to be what God didn't want for them. And so now the place has to get fixed up. And the very creatures which stirred up the problems in the first place, the humans, will become its saviors in God's plan for salvation and redemption. But this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't square with basic human logic. If one person or a small group of people is the source of destruction, well, you'd think that God would keep them as far away from the plan of rebuilding as possible. However, that's not how God is working in this case. In fact, God is calling forth the very people who caused the problems in the first place to be repairers and rebuilders of God's beautiful world. When God declares to the people that they will be a treasured possession and a kingdom of priests, God is ordaining and commissioning them for holy work. Actually, God is calling them forth to be, along with God, the bringers of God's saving grace into a broken world. That's a very awesome responsibility to have. That's a very impactful role to hold within God's world. But as much as it doesn't make sense to our minds for God to choose this, well, we have to remember that it was God's good pleasure to grant this special role to the people. And it's God's good pleasure and God's beautiful wisdom which continues to grant this role to all of us. We are the very same people described in Exodus. We read this narrative from Exodus not merely as reading a story which took place thousands of years ago with a distant and remote people. When we read the story in Exodus, we're instead reading our own family history. We are hearing over the shoulders of all those who have come before us. We are hearing our sacred duty proclaimed. We are still God's treasured possession. We are all still priests ordained and set apart for our God. We are still a holy people summoned by our God to holy work. We are called, just like those who have come before us, to be this special people for God. The calling of God transforms who we are and whose we are. It takes us from where we've always been and we're transported in a moment to a brand new place. We're made a whole people who are equipped by our God to do this holy work. In the transfiguration of Jesus, we see this pattern emerging, but in a different way. He had been going about the countryside, healing and teaching, feeding and proclaiming. His work was reinventing the paradigm for Israel that they would, once again, no longer be a captured people. They weren't going to be lackeys of a foreign king. Instead, they would be God's whole people again. In this moment on the mountain, just like the one with Moses at Sinai generations before, the presence of God is readily apparent and actively at work. Jesus is transformed before the disciples' eyes and is prepared for the next leg of his holy journey. In this mysterious moment on the mountain, God prepares Jesus for his passion and begins to send him on his way to the cross. And Jesus' identity, who he was and to whom he belonged, was confirmed by the very voice of God. The disciples were implored to listen to his teaching, to follow his leadership. They were made well aware that the man that they had been following, the man that they had trusted thus far, was the man who would be their ultimate rescuer. But this didn't come without fear and trepidation. I mean, it's not every day that the sky cracks open, your boss turns a, ba a dazzling color of white, and this great voice from the sky declares his holy sonship. That would put anybody back on their heels. However, in the very same moment of their terror, they become relieved. This Jesus, they find out, who controls heaven and earth and has a constituency with God, is the one who can be trusted. He isn't a maniacal leader. He's not a murderous governor. He's one to whom they can actually attach themselves. And while this Matthean narrative has always been seen as being about Jesus, I see it about the disciples, about Peter, James, and John, that they are central to that story. 
Their identity is transformed in the very same moment with Jesus. They too are caught up in God's cosmic dance. They too are being made holy and are being sent on the same journey with Christ. Their relationship to Jesus is what gives them their own identity. It's what answers the question who and whose they are. The disciples are transformed along with Jesus because of the closeness of their relationship to him. They have followed him throughout the years and have worked alongside him each day. When Jesus is transfigured, they too receive a transformation. The very same is true of us. Our proximity to Jesus by the faith and the hope that we hold in him and his kingdom come are what set our identity for us. When we were called by God to new life, we were granted this identity. We were called, along with the millions before us, to be a holy kingdom of priests serving our God. But after hearing all of this, we have to ask the question, what in practical terms does it mean for me to be a priest who is saved and transformed by God and sent forward to do God's work? What, in other words, should my life look like? Well, in essence, our lives should look like an extension of the life of Jesus. For the Israelites, their newly minted lives and freedom were defined for them by the Ten Commandments. All of these words from God were meant to define how they were living, not for their own holiness, but for the holiness of their neighbors and of the whole world. Remember, the bulk of the commandments have to do with how we treat our neighbor. Don't bear false witness, don't covet, don't steal, don't murder, don't sleep with somebody else's spouse, and on and on. When God inaugurated the new covenant in Christ, these same defining characteristics still held true, but instead of just being some black and white rules, God gave them shape and definition and color in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Our Christ was forever walking from village to dell, feeding, healing, forgiving, and loving his neighbor, even his non-Jewish neighbor. He defined neighbor as anyone with whom we hold any amount of proximity at any point of any day. So basically, everybody alive. For us, our priesthood involves mimicking as closely as we can the acts of our Christ. What he did is what we must strive to do. But we can't just be active with our hands, as important as that is. We have to be active with our hearts, with our minds, with our words. It's a very important thing for us to serve actively as God's priests. But it's also another thing for us to remember to speak as God's priests. Remember that the priests of the temple not only carried out the acts of sacrifice, they also taught the stories and they impressed the law upon the people. For us, we too have to open our mouths. When we see injustice committed, we speak up and we speak out against it because we know that it is contrary to our God's ways. When people are being silenced, we have to act as their voice because Christ gave voice to the voiceless. When people are unsure about God, we tell them the old, old story that we know so well of Jesus and his love. We tell how Jesus has loved us in spite of ourselves and has made a way for us to be saved. We don't boast in our salvation, however, as if it were something that we could do or did do all on our own. Instead, we boast in the saving work of our God. We boast in God's grace. We tell people of God's desire to love them, to welcome them into God's family. Our entire lives, when we are living as priests, when we are living as the priests we were called to be, well, then our entire lives will be spent worshiping and adoring our God and working together with our God to be saving agents for the creation. Our lives stand at the intersection of the life that we live in the present state of the world and the life that God is breaking forth every single day. We stand with our lives pivoted between God's sacred world to come and the common world that we live in right now. We are hinges that stand at the intersection to draw people closer to God. 
We stand not as the holy and the righteous, but as the saved and forgiven who are being redeemed for the purpose of serving God and neighbor. Our whole lives are to be a living testimony for the saving grace, the merciful forgiveness, and the life of redemption that God has given to the world. When we are priests, we are salt. We serve the interests of the other over the self. We give of ourselves for the benefit of our neighbor. In our giving, we worship God. In our giving, we testify with our bodies of God's work. In our giving, we work with our God to bring forth life to the people and to the world around. When we speak, we speak as vessels of light. We shine forth not our, our own light. We shine forth not our own greatness or our own self-centered accolades, but instead we speak gospel words. We speak a living testimony of how God has reached into whatever pit we were found in and rescued us from it and set us back on both feet, giving us a place in God's holy creation, not as servants and slaves, but as holy workers of God's sacred will. If you remember, our vision for this year is summed up in the phrase, inside out. Everything that we do here each Sunday, our singing, our worship, our praying, our sacraments, our fellowship, our everything, well, they have to be taken out the doors every single week when we go back into the world. Our temple is not confined to this building or, frankly, to any building that was constructed with human hands because we live and serve within the precincts of God's temple, which is the entire creation. Wherever we are located, we are assured that we are within God's sacred space. Therefore, our duty to serve as priests never ends. No matter where we go or what occupation we have or where we live, we will always be within our God's temple. When we take the church and make it inside out, we take all of the sacred and far too often privately held rituals, traditions, and teachings, and we carry them out to the world. We use what we have learned here to build up the world around us. We take these sacred acts and this holy fellowship just outside and beyond this time and space. We do this because we were saved. We do this because God has granted us a brand new identity. We do this because we live our lives at the intersection of what is and what will be. When we embrace our priesthood, then we proclaim with our whole lives our bodies, and our voices. We proclaim the good news of our God. We have been saved. We have been redeemed for a purpose. We have been saved, redeemed, and made whole again so that God's kingdom can reign on the earth. Let us never forget that the good news is this. We were saved. We were redeemed. We were made whole again. Now that we are aware of this, it's time for us to go and save the world, to redeem it and to make it whole. It's time for us to turn the church inside out. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Good, holy, loving, and gracious God. Through these four weeks, we prayed for the presence of your spirit to be upon us. To know how that we can be your church moving forward. So that we can hear your voice, so we can follow your call. Loving God, you've called us by your holy word revealed in scripture to be a sacrificial people. To be a people of fellowship and love. To be a people who are salt and light for the world. To be priests serving your kingdom. God, ordain us this day. Commission us and set us apart to be your kingdom of priests. Send us out with our hearts fulfilled, with our mouths full of your good news, with our hands ready to do service in your kingdom. Loving God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us that as we move forward in this year, that we would more fully grow into our identity as your people, saved and redeemed by your grace and your love alone. Saved and redeemed and sent forward to be your saving agents in this world. 
saved and redeemed, commissioned and set apart to be your holy workers, working with you to redeem this world that you love so much. Loving God, help us to turn inside out. Help us to turn all the love that we have received from you in ourselves out to the world. Let us be a light to the nations, a blessing to people. People who bring your holy, gracious word with us wherever we go. God, when we get tired, we pray for your strength. When we become fearful, we pray for your courage. When we have no idea what to say, we pray for the wisdom of your Holy Spirit that we would be able to communicate your gospel love. God, as we move forward in this year, let us grow closer to one another and to you. Let us grow in strength and purpose to be your holy people, your priests, once again. Let us carry forward out of this time and place, every time we gather together, your holy words, your presence, your love. Let us take what we have put inside of ourselves and turn it out. Wherever we go and whatever we do, O oh God, let us be a rich blessing to your kingdom that is breaking forward each moment. Help us, O oh God, to rebuild this congregation. Help us, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, to rebuild our faith in you. To press forward no matter what. To have your courage and your strength no matter what. To hear your voice calling out to us and to go and listen and follow it. Grant us your courage this day, O oh God. Grant us your wisdom and your power and your love. And these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who alone is head of the church and leads us forward. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us stand. We are going to sing this Sunday. We're going to sing Say So. But you're going to hear a real different version of it. So you best be ready to rock in God's name. <laughs> you're going to break the Presbyterian right on out of you, okay? <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic for a bunch of Presbyterians. You notice on the back there we had to steal it from the Baptists, so don't tell them what we did there. We have been redeemed for a purpose. We have been called and set apart by our God for a very specific purpose. To tell God's good news. Amen. Not just to the people that you know, but to people you've never met yet. People that you're just now meeting. To show and demonstrate in your whole life that you are a priest called and commissioned by God to carry God's word, to do God's work, to redeem this beautiful creation that God has made where God can live with us and we can live with our God. We are being called and sent this very day to be these priests. So go out now in the power, the grace, the mercy, and the love, the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let the redeemed say, Amen. Amen. Amen.